into in this third lecture today we'll consider the topic may you have religion that is a way of life you don't have to emphasize the word religion let's just have what we can call a way of life all the different religions whether the lower ones or the higher ones all of them can be a way of life if it isn't if if some religion isn't a way of life then it isn't really genuine religion it's not true religion but if it's actually religion then we will be able to use it as a way of life if we can't use it as a way of life then it has no benefit and no value for us Buddhism of course ought to be a way of life if we have gotten interested in Buddhism but for as long as we're unable to use it as a way of life then we don't really have or understand Buddhism if it's just some kind of intellectual interest or something it hasn't become Buddhism yet and it doesn't have any real benefits or value for us it's merely some ceremonies or rituals or trivia to to stimulate ourselves emotionally and so we have to be able to take buddhism and use it as a methodology for living our lives rather than merely rites and rituals and so this is what we'll spend the most time talking about Buddhism as a method and way for living one's life. So obviously this is a matter of life, a matter about life, about living our lives. Buddhism is a way to to study and develop our lives as far as we can go. To take a life all the way to the goal of life so let's make it very clear from the start that buddhism that religion is a matter about life most especially the way of living life so then we come we must come to the question what then is the goal of life where what are we aiming for in life we can answer this by saying that there are only two two goals in life or there is only two aspects to the goal in life the first is realizing a peaceful coolness or a a blissful tranquility personally so personal peacefulness and coolness is the first the second goal is to have a life that is truly of benefit of others so the second goal is to live one's life for others or we could say for one's life to have value for everyone these are the two goals of life personal peace and the benefit of others so then there are two two words will be enough for this the first word is peaceful and the second word is beneficial and allow us to point out that if you want anything more than this then you're crazy let's look 
at the individual side first. There's nothing we want more in life than blissfulness. Excuse me, earlier I said peacefulness. Blissfulness. But the blissfulness we're talking about must also be peaceful. What is there higher in life that we could ask for than blissfulness? For the Christian, the highest thing in life, the, the, the thing that we ask for from, from God through the grace of God, the highest grace of God is just the blissfulness of being with God. And to ask or want anything more than that, wouldn't that be crazy? And then as, as regards others, the important word is beneficial to live a life that is of benefit and value to, to others. However, we often say to be of a life that is beneficial for both sides, meaning for oneself as well as others. We say this because the two are, are interconnected, are interrelated. It's impossible to lead a life that is truly of benefit for others if it isn't of benefit for ourselves as well. So these two are intimately related. Therefore, we can say that the only two goals in life are blissfulness for oneself and a life that is beneficial for others or for for everyone. These are, this is the legitimate aim and goal of our lives. Every one of us should have easily observed a very basic fact about life, which is that life cannot remain still. Being alive, it is necessary to move and to act. If we were to remain perfectly still, then we would no longer be alive. So the question becomes then, if we must move and must act as just something inherent in life, then how are we going to move? And for what purpose are we going to act? And so first of all, we, we act in order to achieve our own benefit, which is the blissful peace. And then also to benefit others. Even if we have lived our lives so in such a way that we have accomplished our own benefit, we have per completely fulfilled our own need for peaceful bliss, then of course there still remains the second goal of helping others. Having achieved true peace and bliss within ourselves, then we can live our lives in order to help others to achieve the same within their own lives. So no matter what, as long as we live and act and move, there is always something of importance for us to do. So then there are only two matters for us to concern ourselves. The first is peaceful bliss for ourselves. And then the second is blissful peace for others. Now, if we wish, we can join these two matters together. And then the only thing worth discussing is blissful peacefulness for ourselves and others, for everyone, for all parties, which is to say 
the only important issue is blissful peace for the world. Now for the, the world, if we talk about peace for the world, it includes obviously both ourselves as well as everyone else. And so it encompasses all sides, all, all peoples, all parties, excluding no one. But for this blissful peace to be realized in the world, it can't happen without the peacefulness of individual people. If individual people aren't at peace, then there's no way the world can be at peace. So this is the kind of thing we have to look into. Why is it like this? So we must examine the question of peacefulness within the world. World peace, there is no world peace without individual peace. This is a fundamental fact that we must observe from the start, otherwise we'll get everything backwards. So, in order to bring about world peace, we must learn how to find individual peace. If you are a follower of a theistic religion, then you will have various ways and means of praying to or asking God or the gods or whatever to, to give us peace. We'll have various ways of, of praying to God in order to achieve peace. If, however, one is a follower of an atheistic or non-theistic religion such as Buddhism, then we, we take an opposite approach. Rather than praying to God, we just turn around and come to terms with this thing called the self. We come and we deal with this self in a correct, improper way. So that the, and once the self has been taken care of properly, then there will be peace within that individual. And it isn't necessary to beg or plead or pray to any God. So these are the basic two approaches for achieving individual peace. If one is a Christian, forgive us, by the way, for, for using Christians as a representative of the various theistic religions, but it's easiest for us to use the example of Christians. But if one is a Christian, one prays for the grace of God to save us. But if one is a Buddhist, one destroys that, that one who desires the very grace of God. Take a look at these. Which one of them is, is good and, or which one is crazy or mad? Compare the two. One is to pray for the grace of God, and the other is to destroy the one who prays and desires that grace. Which of these is reasonable and which, or, or are they, are they crazy? First of all, it's important for us to be aware of this difference in these two approaches or methodologies. If we don't see the difference, we might confuse them and mix ourselves up and not be able to use either of them properly. So first of all, we should look at the difference between the approach that, that asks or begs or prays for the grace of God and then the approach of Buddhism 
which turns around and destroys that individual, that sense of personhood that begs, that, that wants the grace of God. Here, we've come to study the approach used in Buddhism, the approach of getting rid of or destroying the self. And so one has to be clear about the difference between this approach and the other approach. If you can't see the difference, then how will you be able to use either approach properly? Here we're using anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, in order to destroy the self so that we, so that life is free of I and mind, free of selfishness, emancipated from the self, from the ego. This is the approach of Buddhism. Can you see how it differs from the other approach? If you, the earlier talks, we just talked about getting free of self, the importance and the problem of self and getting free of it. And now we'll talk about the benefits of this, but we must see how it differs from other approaches in order to appreciate it. When we have no need or desire for grace, then we are God, aren't we? God is the one who doesn't need any grace. God has no need for grace. And so when one is free of this need, when there is no desire for grace, then one becomes God, doesn't one? Please listen carefully. And please, please don't think that we're, we're trying to put down other religions or other points of view. All we're trying to do is study this subject and look at it carefully. If we destroy the self, the individual who desires who wants grace. Normally, we're, we're always wanting grace from something. But if we destroy the self that desires, then that's like being God, isn't it? Please, please approach this question very carefully. We'd like to stress that we're not implying any criticism or we're not looking down on other religions in any way. But we do feel it's necessary to discriminate and observe the differences in the methods of the different religions. But this does not imply any value judgment of any kind. Now, if we have received the highest, the fullest grace, if all possible grace has befallen us, then there still remains the self that receives, that gets, and that has this grace. Isn't that how it is? Even in receiving the fullest grace, there remains the self who, who receives and has the grace. And that being so, would this be the end of dukkha? Would this be the, the utter cessation of suffering? We should, or if there is still the self remaining to, to get the grace. What kind of situation is that? What kind of self 
doesn't become a burden? What kind of self is there that doesn't need to be carried around and endured constantly? If you've got a diamond, even the best, most wonderful diamond, the most desirable diamond in the world, where can you put it where you don't have to carry it around? Are you going to hang it from your ear or around your neck or stick it in your nose? Whatever you do with it, as long as you have it, then you have to carry it and it's a burden. What kind of self is there that we don't have to carry around, that we don't have to put up with and endure? So then, if we don't, if we wish to escape that burden, having to carry something around all the time, if there's always a self, because of that attachment, there is always the activity of carrying it around. So if we wish to be free of this, we need to get rid of the self, get free of the self. If you take all your diamonds and get them locked up in a safe at the bank, then those diamonds, although they're very safely locked up away at the bank, they become a burden for us. They still squeeze and pressure the mind. And so if we've got a self, no matter where we put it, no matter who we give it to, it still squeezes, it still oppresses the mind. This activity of carrying around the self, as long as we've got one, will always be heavy. It's always burdensome. It always, it's something difficult to endure, something that's a hassle. So what are we going to do with this self so that it's no longer a burden, no longer a hassle, something difficult to put up with in our lives? As long as there is any attachment, then there is a self. And this self, this burden of self, is the exact same thing as suffering. This, this self we carry around is dukkha, is misery for us, which is the exact opposite of this grace which we so, so strongly desire. As long as there is any self, then we have to, to carry this all around and it's heavy and difficult. As long as there is a self, then there are problems. Even if God gives us all the grace that we could receive, if we had all the grace we wanted, if there was still a self, then there would still be problems in spite of all that grace. So then isn't it better to, to destroy the self that's the source and the basis of all our problems? Why not just go and get rid of the self so that all the problems disappear and we don't have to put up with any more of this suffering? Let me 
repeat once again something I've been repeating over and over again for years. Let me repeat it and insist that what I've been saying to my Christian comrades all along is absolutely correct. It was correct many years ago and it remains correct today. I, ins I insist on this because it's absolutely true and correct. I have very many Christian friends and I say to them all that the true meaning of Christianity that in the symbol of the cross the, the heart of Christianity is displayed. Even if you've never heard this before in church or wherever, allow me to insist on the correctness of what I'm saying, that the cross is the, the essence of Buddhism, the, the cutting of the eye, the destruction of the self. This, this is true for, for every Christian. And so I've been saying this all along, and I continue to say it and insist upon it, that this is what Christianity is really about, is this cutting, this destroying of the I, the ego, the self. And when there's no self, then we have no more need for either grace or disgrace. And when one has nothing to do with grace or disgrace anymore, then one is God. This is what Christianity is about. I insist that this is, this is correct and true. Let us request that you, that you examine the truth of this, this symbol of the cross. Even though some people have complained that it only works in English, the truth, even if it doesn't fit for German or some other languages, the truth of this symbol is the same, that the cross stands for the cutting of the eye. Or if you'd like, the cross stands for the, the cutting of number one, and we all know who number one is. It's the destroying of this self that we cling to. So this truth, even if it's clearest in English, the cutting of the eye, the destroying of the self, it's, it's nonetheless true. This is the profound meaning behind the symbol of the cross that no one should overlook. And then when one has, is free of the I, then it is possible to understand God, what God is. As long as there is I or self, we can only guess at the, what, the, what the meaning of God is. To explain what God is in, in, in our language is very difficult to do. But there's one thing we can say with absolute certainty, that God, even God, is not self. True, the true God, the real God, is not self. You can't find any self in God. Although in our ordinary way of speaking, we sometimes might say that God is the utmost self, the highest self, or whatever. In reality, in truth, God is not self. And to realize this, the only way is to cut the eye, destroy the the sense of self in order to realize that even God 
is not self. This, this is the heart of Buddhism. The, the symbol of the cross explains exactly what Buddhism is teaching. And in this cutting of the eye and realization that everything, even God, is not self, this is the completion of Buddhism. With this understanding, Buddhism is finished. Now there might arise the question for those of you who consider yourselves to be children of God. If we are children of God, then what are we to do? The answer is that we must follow God. We must walk according to God's way and keep walking along this God's path until coming to voidness of self. When we are void of self, when we are without self, completely emancipated from self, then we are with God. We are the same as God. We are united with God. Because God is this, is also completely void of self. God is this, this voidness. According to the principle of Buddhism, this is what the children of God must do. Walk according to God until united with God in voidness, completely free of self, of I, and of mind. In India, they have been teaching about the self or the soul or the Atman for thousands of years. And they, they carried this teaching on up to the point of talking about the universal self. Buddhism arose in India after this. And so there was no need for Buddhism to continue saying the same old thing. Instead, Buddhism went further, took the truth further and deeper, and taught that there is ultimately no self, that everything is void of self, and that there is universal voidness. This is what Buddhism has taught. If we are going to understand Buddhism at all, we must recognize this central teaching. Buddhism didn't merely carry on with the same old Indian teaching, but went deeper and has proclaimed the universal voidness that everything is without self. When there is no self, when this is realized, then there is nothing that is a basis or foundation for any problem, for any, any difficulties or pain in our lives. And so this, then, is the legitimate, ultimate goal of our lives, something that would really be the final goal of our lives would have to be something that is completely free of problems. If any problems remain, how could we say that we have achieved the highest thing or the final goal? The final goal must be completely free of any problems, of difficulties, of any trouble. And the only way to be completely free of trouble is to destroy the self, which is the source and basis of all trouble. So this, then, is the final goal of this thing we call life. This is something that God commanded just after, just after setting up the world. Way back in the beginning of the world, God commanded the first 
husband and wife to not attach to good and to evil. Way back in the beginning, God laid down this commandment. This is very important to see this. When there is attachment to good or attachment to evil, then all kinds of problems and troubles arise. But if there's no attachment to good and evil, then there is no self to attach to these things. There is no self that is trapped within duality. And so then we are beyond all good and evil, beyond all dualities, and are completely free. And so completely free of all troubles. This is the, the pinnacle, the highest peak of Buddhism, to, by being completely free, being without self, not having any basis on which to, to evaluate and discriminate things as good and evil, and not uh, discriminating these things, not attaching to them and not attaching to them, having no self or ego to experience problems. This is the highest teaching of Buddhism, and it's also the, the early teaching of God, way back when the world was first created. In Anapanasati, the first group of that the first tetrad of the practice allows us to understand and calm the body and then gather together the mental power and to focus our attention sufficiently for us to study and investigate this matter of not-self. This can be a, so this is how we use the first tetrad, the first step of anapanasati, those related specifically to the breathing and the body. Then in the second tetrad, the one about the Vedana, we, we learn how to keep these vetana from deceiving us. We get these vetana under control so that they don't trick us into thinking that this is positive and that is negative. And when we no longer are deluded by the vetana into thinking that things are positive or negative, then the mind is even more free and clear. The third tetrad is called Jita Nu Patsana, the contemplation of Jita, of mind. In this one we learn how to control the mind, how to develop it, train it, and control it, control it so that it can keep itself in a state of correctness. So the mind is always proper, appropriate, incorrect. And when the mind is controlled like this, then it, it can stay in a state where the self does not arise. This is the importance of the third tetrad, controlling the mind to prevent self from arising. Then we come to the fourth and final tetrad of Anapanasati, which is called Dhammanu Patsana, the contemplation of Dhamma, of natural truth. In this one, we then contemplate the truths of impermanence, oppressiveness, and not selfhood. We keep, we observe all all things, both those which are conditioned, caused, concocted, 
and the things which are unconditioned, the thing which has no cause, which has no end. We study all things, both the concocted and the unconcocted, until seeing that they are seeing the truth of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness or oppressiveness, and not selfhood. Seeing this, then, seeing that things are not self, we see that things merely proceed, go along, according to the law of conditionality, that things happen depending on conditions, that there's no, they don't happen dependent on some self or on self, but just on causes and conditions. Seeing that everything just happens according to the law of conditionality, then we see that everything is void of self. In seeing the voidness of everything, everything, then the mind is free. Seeing this voidness, the mind is completely liberated from all self. And then there is nothing left to control because there is no possibility that self will arise again if voidness has been truly penetrated. And so this is what occurs in the last step of anapanasati. Finally, we would like to make a request, or we could say, <clears throat> we'd like to plead with you to, to please use anapanasati correctly as we have described. Use it successfully in order to be freed of this self. Please use anapanasati to realize voidness and be liberated from the self. And then all problems, all troubles will disappear instantaneously. And you will have realized and achieved the final goal of life. You will have accomplished that which you must accomplish. So we hope, we hope that you will do so and be completely successful. And now we will, we ask to close this final lecture.